Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of The Cyclo Edition, the podcast for those looking to go above and beyond in their understanding of the organic literature. I'm Wesley Swords, and I'm joined today by Grace Lutovsky and Matthew Genzink. The paper we will be discussing is titled Practical and Regioselective Amination of Arenes Using Alkylamines. This paper comes from the group of Daniele Leonore, who is a reader in organic chemistry at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom. The research group is focused on the discovery, design, and development of novel catalytic methods for chemical synthesis with a particular interest in the formation of CN bonds. The paper we are discussing today is a very nice example of this goal. In this paper, the authors construct aromatic amines through the photochemical generation of a nitrogen radical. They start with a secondary or primary amine and through in situ chlorination with N-chlorosuccinamide or NCS, get the N-chloroamine. Protonation of this N-chloroamine by perchloric acid yields the electrophilic protonated chloroamine, and at this point, light excitation of a photocatalyst produces a strong reductant that reduces the chloroamine, which then loses chloride and leaves an aminium radical. This radical then reacts with the arene in solution to provide the arylamine products. Great yields, a large substrate scope, and a generous application to industrial and medicinally relevant chemistry shows the strength of this approach and provides significant interest in future development for these reactions. So the formation of carbon heteroatom bonds is an important reaction for medicinal chemistry. If you look at many natural products, a lot of them have these carbon heteroatom bonds present, um, and that's one of the best ways to construct these complex natural products. So reactions uh, that form carbon heteroatom bonds are really important but are not necessarily developed to the point that they're always easy to make. Yeah so in 2011 there was a journal of medicinal chemistry paper that came out and tried to kind of identify the frequency of all the different styles of carbon heteroatom bonds that are being formed and one of the interesting cases was this idea that of all those reactions forming carbon nitrogen bonds accounted for about 50 percent of those reactions. And looking closer at each of these carbon-nitrogen bond-forming reactions used in medicinal chemistry, they broke down this category further into specific reactions. Um, They found that N-substitution with alkyl halides accounted for about 5% of all reactions performed in medicinal chemistry, and another 5% were reductive amination reactions. Um, So overall, 10% of the reactions performed in medicinal chemistry are reactions that Leonori now provides a new method of doing in his paper. Right. Like one of the ways before to like get the style of chemistry, um, you needed directing groups on the aryl compounds, either uh, pseudohalides or halides or boronic acids to try and direct that style of chemistry. But um, in this paper, Lenore has been able to kind of, at least in parafunctionalization, beat out a lot of those reactions. So before we get too far into the details of this paper, let's go through this reaction again and make sure that we're all on the same page with the reaction that has been developed. So Leonori couples unactivated arenes with primary or secondary amines to form CH amination products. Um, And he does this by using NCS, a photocatalyst, acid, and light. So if we look a little bit closer about what's going on in this reaction, um, NCS adds to the amine, making an N-chloroamine, and then upon addition of acid, the species becomes protonated. Uh, With light, the chloride anion leaves, and then from here, it's just standard EAS, EAS chemistry, uh, which allows the formation of the desired product. Yeah, so in general, this reaction is taking uh, an arene and basically making an aryl amine. And I think before we get into the scope of the reaction, it would be helpful to look at previous reactions that are also kind of doing this transformation to kind of see where they're good and kind of also where they may fall short. Yeah, I agree, Matt. I think if we look at some of the products formed in this paper, one way that we could think about making these uh, molecules is by EAS chemistry or electrophilic aromatic substitution chemistry. Um, This is a reaction taught in the majority of sophomore organic chemistry courses, so it's probably familiar to most of us, Um, but the reaction is taking an unsubstituted arene, which then will undergo nitration to give a nitro-substituted arene, uh, which then can be reduced to the free amine, um, and then it can be alkylated to install whichever R groups we choose. 
Uh, so this is an approach to make several similar molecules that we probably have all seen before. Right, but one of the one of the downsides there is right. You have three or four steps right to make a, a primary or secondary uh, alkyl aryl amine, and so to look at other ways that this reaction or people have tried to go about making these style of aryl amines, um, you can look back even as far as you know 1901 or 1904. Um, people were trying to get over that hump of needing this many steps to generate these. Uh, these reactions. Um, so the Ullman reaction, um, where he did his first kind of Ullman style reaction in 1901, where he looked at the coupling of heteroaryls using copper zero. Um, and then in 1904, he applied that to now making um, ethers or uh, amines using a copper two reagent. So he takes a uh, haloarene um, and then just reacts it with an aryl amine. And then using a copper two catalyst is able to then undergo a reductive coupling of those two systems to give you a, a new uh, carbon nitrogen bond and a new aryl amine. I guess I didn't realize that reaction was that old. It was really interesting to like, yeah, look into that and see. That. And this was a nice reaction, especially back in 1901, yeah. you said, Wes. <laughs> but at the same time, I think we have to keep in mind that uh, the aryl coupling partner is pre-functionalized, right? So it's an aryl halide. It's not just an arene by itself. This isn't CH activation. It's a pre-functionalized aryl halide. And it's at really high temperatures. So the first almond reaction that was recorded was at temperatures between 100 and 300 degrees Celsius. <laughs> so pretty forcing conditions. Yeah. Yeah, later on, chan lamb couplings were developed, and so that's your CN bond formation. Very, very similar to the Ullman reaction, except this time it uses an aryl boronic acid um, with your amine and using copper 2 as an oxidant again. Um, I found it really interesting that this goes about coupling two nucleophilic species, uh, where the Ullman reaction uses an aryl halide, so that's more of an electrophile nucleophile reaction. And this is something that Matt and I were talking about this morning, actually, was the Chan Lam is basically a cross nucleophile coupling, and that's kind of an interest. So you do a transmetallation with the boronic acid to generate your, your aryl copper species that then undergoes the nucleophilic reaction. Have either of you done a Chan Lam coupling? Nope. No. Me neither. Uh, but I was reading <laughs> <laughs> that they are horrible. Um, <laughs> like, apparently, according to Derek Lowe's blog, um, it's in the pipeline, they're just a mess. So if you, like, change your uh, substrates a little bit or if you change your, like, reaction conditions a little bit, you'll, you might shut down reactivity. And it's, there's no really, like, reason. Some of our group who have been trying to do chain lamp couplings or trying to do uh, couplings with, say, BF3K salts or boronic acids, there are lots of ways to do a chain lamp because of that difficulty and functionality. But apparently there's a report in 2017 um, where they studied the mechanism of this reaction, and so that really like revolutionized like how people were running these um, because they were able to identify some of the byproducts that came out if you changed the conditions. Um, so another method that is very popular in like modern organic chemistry are these buckwell hardwood cross-couplings. And so um, this is using an aryl halide and a primary or secondary amine with a palladium catalyst to do the same amination. Yeah, so these buckwald hartwig reactions are probably the most used in, especially medchem, I would say, for forming these aryl amines. And I think the important thing to note here is that with all of these cross-coupling reactions that we've mentioned, the almond reaction, the chan lamb coupling, the buckwald hartwig reaction, they're all powerful methods, but they all involve pre-functionalized aryl coupling partners. So it's just kind of one limitation. I think as we like progress as a field, we're trying to get away from that. And so that's when these other methods um, where you're doing a direct CH functionalization uh, becomes ideal. All of the cross-coupling reactions that we've talked about previously have involved pre-functionalized aryl coupling partners. And Leonori takes a bit of a different approach. So instead of using this cross-coupling strategy, he uses N-centered radicals. So he has a paper out in 2017 in Angavanta where he starts with unfunctionalized arenes and he couples them with basically a pre-functionalized amine. So in this case, that's an o aryl hydroxylamine. And under the conditions of this reaction, he is accessing an aminium radical, which is able to react with the arene and yield an aryl amine. So it makes sense then that the next step in his research program would be trying to generate this in situ um, to be able to start with a free amine that you want to couple and then go forward with the reaction. And that's exactly what this Nature Chem paper addresses. So in this paper, they start with their secondary amine and with NCS, they generate the N-chloroamine, which then upon protonation, you get this protonated chloroamine. 
So then your photocatalyst reduces off chloride to leave your aminium radical, which this is then a highly electrophilic species. And so um, your unfunctionalized airing can do a radical addition to form a stabilized cyclohexyl hexadienyl type radical, which then your photocatalyst can oxidize and upon deprotonation, you are left with the product. Right. So I think looking kind of through these reactions, there, there, there may be three or four different kind of sections that you can break this mechanism down into. The one maybe we want to start with is this idea that you can take the chloroamine, protonate it in super acidic solution, and then um, somehow gen you know, remove the chloride to generate the aminium ion. And this actually harkens back to 1960s chemistry from Meniski where he actually looked at isolating chloroamines, dumping them into sulfuric acid, um, in some cases fuming sulfuric acid or mixed sulfuric acid acetic acid solutions to then generate that protonated amine and then adding in redox active transition metal species so that you could reduce off chloride or um, shining UV light on this chemistry to then generate the aminium radical that can then react through this system. And so he was able to form these amine products back in the, the 1960s. And I think that's really interesting that we haven't seen many reports of this since, um, but it makes sense because you are doing this in concentrated sulfuric acid. Who wants to work with that? And then your chloroamines are very toxic species. They can be explosive. So this chemistry is kind of dangerous. <laughs> right. They also like rapidly decompose. Um, and so they're very difficult to work with. Um, the, the most recent kind of article that I could find that was working with them, because there have been people who have isolated them and tried to do meniscus style chemistry, kind of like a couple of papers every few years. But in 20, uh, 2018, uh, Marsden, who's at uh, the University of Leeds, um, published a chem side paper that looked at um, kind of a very similar reaction to what Lenori did, um, but an intramolecular uh, amidation. And they did kind of both. They isolated the chloroamine and showed that they could do meniscus style chemistry, but using much weaker acid in dichloromethane. They also showed that you could, um, through just the addition of NCS, chlorinate your amine in situ. So you, you just initially make the chloroamine by adding an equivalent of NCS, then add in your acid and go through that reaction. So you bypass that um, kind of highly reactive chloroamine that you may have to isolate. And I think just to contrast those two papers a little bit uh, to kind of show why they're different. Leonori, in this case, generates the protonated chloroamine in situ and utilizes this ruthenium photocatalyst to reduce off the chloride. Whereas in the case of the Marston chem -Sci paper, he used ultraviolet light, I think. Right. Yeah, he used ultraviolet light to kind of homolytically cleave the nitrogen chloride bond to make the aminium. So one of the difficulties that Leonori had to overcome when optimizing this reaction was avoiding the chlorinated product that was a result of EAS chemistry with the protonated chloroamine. So if you think about that protonated chloroamine, it's basically an electrophilic source of chlorine. Um, so you have an electrophilic source of chlorine, you have a nucleophilic arene, and you can think about EAS chemistry with the resulting chloro chloroarene. So to combat this, Leonori basically just screens solvents and screens acids, and he finds that the right combination of solvent and acid is perchloric acid in either HFIP, which is hexafluoroisopropanol, or acetonitrile. Yeah, and he notes that um, HFIP works the best with uh, weakly electron-rich arenes, and so that's like a terbutyl substitute arene or just phenyl um, style arenes, whereas acetyl nitrile works better with electron-rich arenes. And this kind of links back to even some of Meniski chemistry and um, the Marsden paper where both of them are limited in their use of more electron-rich arenes, um, namely because they're doing it either in really harsh conditions with sulfuric acid, and they get that chlorinated byproduct. Basically just by finding the proper acid, Lenori is able to come up with a way to bypass that and be able to get some of this productive reactivity with um, very electron-rich arenes. Um, so looking at the scope of this reaction, they show that they can do this on many different functionalized arenes. Um, so they can tolerate quite a few different functional groups um, and also extended um, polycyclic systems like naphthalene with various derivatives. Um, in all of these examples, they're primarily all para-substituted, but there are a couple cases where they see some meta-selectivity. Um, um, and then looking at the amine scope, uh, they do, again, quite a few different cyclic amines with multiple um, or various substitutions. Um, but then they also show uh, multiple examples of primary amines. 
So this, this scope is really impressive. Um, but I think the cases where I would have liked to have seen them being put in the paper were strongly electron withdrawing groups on an airing. So for instance, something like methylbenzoate or benzonitrile, basically putting a nitrile group on one of these airings. And looking through the SI, they do include some of these examples and they didn't put them in the paper because they didn't work. But I think it's still an important thing to note. Strongly electron withdrawing substituents don't work with this reaction. So kind of going back to the selectivity of this reaction, Grace mentioned earlier that it's highly paraselective. And I think on first glance of this, when we think of radical intermediates, um, we kind of think of them as not normally being selective. Um, and Leonori in this case cites the highly electrophilic nature of this nitrogen-centered radical to show why they are really selective. And we all kind of thought that was an interesting thing to go into. <laughs> Basically, radicals can be either highly nucleophilic or electrophilic, and that can really dictate the selectivity that they show. So a nice example that I found was in the copolymerization of vinyl acetate and methyl acrylate. So this goes by a radical mechanism, um, and it shows really surprising levels of selectivity. There's a perfectly alternating nature between the acrylate and the acetate monomers, um, and that's really due to this idea of radical felicity. So how this reaction actually works is vinyl acetate um, leads to a very nucleophilic radical that reacts with methyl acrylate, which is the more electrophilic monomer. And the resulting monomer that comes from methyl acrylate is an electrophilic radical, which, result, which reacts with the less electrophilic monomer, which is vinyl acetate. So it's really kind of exploiting this idea of radical felicity to get selectivity. And in the case of this paper, they have this highly electrophilic nitrogen-centered radical, which reacts selectively with the most nucleophilic position on an aromatic ring. So then a natural follow-up question to this discussion is, how do you assign radical felicity? And one of the easiest ways to do this is by looking at the one electron oxidation product and one electron reduction product of the starting radical. Um, if the oxidation product is more stable, the original radical is termed nucleophilic, and if the reduction product is more stable, then that's an electrophilic radical. Uh, in Leonori's paper, starting from the aminium radical cation, the oxidation product corresponds to a dication, which is very unstable, whereas the reduction product corresponds to a neutral amine, which is far more stable than the dication, making the aminium radical cation a very electrophilic radical. So looking at just like the airing scope and the amine scope, like this is pretty impressive how many different substrates they can incorporate and do this reaction on. Um, but I think where this paper really stands out is looking at all the further substitution that they did. If you have the paper in front of you, scheme three, and scheme four show how this can be utilized in medicinal chemistry. What excites me about these natural products is like the functional group tolerance that they have. So they're doing this in four equivalents of acid, um, but yet they can, like some of these natural products have alkenes in them, they have amines, they have esters, they have like pretty much every functional group, like free alcohols, that's pretty impressive um, that they can still do these reactions. Right. I, one, one of the like minor complaints that you could have with this is that you have to have two equivalents of the airing ring to make this work. They do in some cases say that they can go down to one equivalent and still get reasonable reactivity, um, but you get a lower yield. Um, they don't make it very specified in the actual paper whether or not they did that with some of these uh, medicinal products. But in terms of, you know, depending on what you want to add, you can probably control for that as well. If you're interested in functionalizing in a complex airing with a nitrogen then you could try and do it one-to-one, -one. but if you, all you want to do is add an airing to a nitrogen, a complex nitrogen, then it actually works better because you'll be able to get high reactivity with using two equivalents of a cheap um, airing. One of the cool things that I really liked um, looking at kind of the scope that he was able to do is the, um, the scale-up ability of this. And so he does this in kind of two ways. One, I didn't think this was even possible, but he was able to scale up this photochemical reaction in a uh, flow setup. So they developed a flow reactor and they were able to 
do this using four equivalents of perchloric acid. Like we aren't even allowed to use perchloric acid in our hoods, <laughs> right? You need a special hood to work with perchloric acid, but they were able to you know, use it in a flow system. Like I would have been worried about corrosion or destruction of the flow system. Um, and so they're able to scale this up to the gram scale, which is really nice and very applicable to industrial chemists. Um, and then they're also able to do a high throughput kind of method. And they took a natural product that they wanted to add an amine to. They could do a 24 well plate reaction um, in high throughput. And then they were able to take the most promising uh, small scale reactions and scale them up again to kind of medicinally relevant levels with a large kind of uh, scope of amines. And so that was really interesting and sh really shows the applicability of this reaction um, beyond just a very simple substrate scope. The other thing that I found from this scope is if you're in industry and if you're kind of trying to say to yourself, all right, I need to make this aryl mean, how am I going to make it? And you have this whole toolbox of reactions. How are you going to know if this one is something you want to use? And I feel that it's pretty, from the scope, it's pretty easy to tell um, if the reaction is going to work or not. So basically, you can't have an electron withdrawing group, but other than that, it works pretty well. If you have acid sensitive functional groups, it's obviously not going to work because you have four equivalents of perchloric acid. But other than that, and what do you guys think about this? Like, I think it works pretty well other than that. Yeah, it's a really extensive substrate scope that they were able to show that this works with, and then they can apply it to complex molecules. Mm -hmm. Kind of one of the thoughts that I've had is the idea is, um, you know, there have been other people who have done this style of chemistry, right? Meninsky in the 1960s. Marsden just came out with a paper, you know, very, they, they look like they were honestly submitted around the same time or very close, this paper in Marsden's paper, um, which came out in ChemSci. He did a very similar reaction, but intramolecularly. None of those papers showed that the chemistry that they developed was going to be as widely applicable as a Buckwald Hartwig, as a Chan Lam, to industrial chemists, to medicinal chemists, to synthetic graduate students. That's what Lenori did here that sets this paper apart and this methodology apart from the other ones that have used this same style of chemistry. Lenori has shown that without the need to pre-functionalize your arine or your amine, you're able to generate it in situ and then use it in this sort of reaction to generate difficult to synthesize secondary amines and primary amines on an arine. If we go kind of to the next scheme and just look at the final the, the, the final thing they did, they, they basically, or what, what I've been saying for the past kind of week is they, they threw the kitchen sink at it. So they did everything, including the kitchen sink, um, when they were looking at doing a substrate scope for this reaction. And so they took some now um, chiral substrates, um, chiral complexes that we typically use for an antioselective synthesis, um, ligands for um, Lewis acids, a binol kind of equivalent, um, that could then be you know, transformed into a chiral amine. Um, so they, they took a lot of um, difficult to kind of functionalize chiral systems and showed that you could late stage add a uh, amine to these sorts of um, complex. Yeah, I think the second part of what you just said, Wes, is kind of like what was so cool to me is that the cross-coupling chemistry, you need a pre-functionalized aryl coupling partner, right? And in the chemistry that Lenori has done before, you need a pre-functionalized amine, which is not trivial, it requires a lot of steps, but this is the first case where you take your amine, you take the aryl coupling partner, you kind of throw them in a one pot and you get an aryl amine, which is pretty powerful. I guess I'm looking forward to what's to come next from Leonori or from other groups and how they're going to use this chemistry to transform um, their own science. Um, so something that would be interesting that I think we would all like to see is developing ortho and meta substituted reactions. So ortho and meta substituted um, variants of this reaction where you can selectively aminate at those positions over the para position. I also think what else can they do with this radical? So in the 60s they generated this radical but because um, their precursor to it was not great to use and they had to use a lot of acid like it wasn't really studied I guess and so now that this has shown a great way to generate it in situ what else can we do to it can you apply it to more than just airings and that's our show 
Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Cyclo Edition. For more information on the paper discussed, we have included a selection of resources we used in our research at the end of the YouTube video. This was our take on a very interesting paper, and we would love to continue the conversation with you. Please comment below the YouTube video and reach out on social media. You can follow the Cyclo Edition on Twitter and Instagram, where we will post updates about our next episode. You can find the Cyclo Edition wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe. We release episodes every other week, and our next episode will be released June 24th. We will provide the paper we will be discussing in the next episode in the description of this podcast, as well as on social media a few days before the next episode is released. We hope you'll tune in on June 24th for our next episode.